as you could tell, we are uh, operating with still a little bit of a skeleton crew in terms of worship leadership, but I am very thankful for the skeleton crew that led today, Tom Kemner, along with uh, the ladies who, um, who provided the, the vocals. I was asked earlier um, about Christmas Eve services. We canceled those, and what was the difference between today and then? Well, the difference is um, the 6 o'clock service Christmas Eve, we had no vocalists available, none whatsoever. So it would have been some instruments and you and me. <laughs> and then the 11 o'clock service, we had no instrumentalists. We only had vocalists. And so we had to kind of just back off and punt, so to speak. And I was watching uh, Facebook feeds and things like that of um, other churches in the community as well as friends of mine that are in the ministry. And uh, I watched with, it with envy because they were putting together um, services that really celebrated the birth of Christ. My daughter attends a church down in Colleen. They did four services on uh, Christmas Eve in order to accommodate the people that wanted to participate. And I was kind of watching it with a tremendous amount of envy and um, maybe even a little bit of angst, you know, on, on why? why. Why are we where we are? And it hasn't, hasn't ended. Um, I guess it was Christmas Eve. Gene Longley began to develop um, symptoms consisted with the COVID-19 um, virus. Uh, he was only tested yesterday. That was the first he could get in to get a test, and results ought to be available today. But I um, got a phone call right before I walked in the building here, and uh, Gene is dealing with the worst headache he's ever had, his words. And uh, nothing seems to be relieving the pain of the headache. And uh, I got a message earlier in the day that one of our life group leaders has begun to show symptoms as well. Uh, virus and is very sick as a result of that. Yesterday, I received note that um, the individual we prayed for last week, um, Jody Kennedy, uh, has been placed on a ventilator in uh, North Carolina as he tries to recover from COVID-19. Um, we have a lot of people that are sick right now within our church family. Uh, as much as we've tried to protect ourselves, all of us, um, I don't know you know, I don't know how this thing's going to play out. I just don't. I'm not a medical professional. I do know that a lot of people I care for deeply are very, very sick. And so we're going to take a moment or two to pray. I, I'm really going to focus very much on Jody and Tricia Kennedy. Uh, Jody and Tricia operate a ministry in Nicaragua. Uh, they also operated a ministry in uh, Western, I'm sorry, Eastern Europe. For many years, and that's kind of changed as well. Uh, Jody and Tricia had to come back to America from uh, Central America. They had to come back to North America, the United States, from Central America because of the social unrest there tied in with elections, uh, great riots and a lot of violence and threats against uh, Westerners and people outside of um, Central America, outside of Nicaragua. So they came home for their own safety, and um, their churches that they helped to establish down there are, are operating with, um, with staff that have very little training in terms of leading a congregation through tremendous difficulties. And so Jody and Trisha have been watching from afar and praying fervently for their church family back in Central America. Jody and Trisha are not the kind of people to just let the dust settle. They have been serving in many capacities, and um, over the last month or so, they've been in North Carolina working with Samaritan's Purse with Operation Christmas Child and the follow-up to that ministry, worldwide distribution of Christmas gifts to children who live in poverty. And then Jody developed um, symptoms, was, was sent to a hospital, uh, moved to ICU, and as I say now, uh, on a ventilator. And the things are very, very serious for him. I, I received a note from Tricia this morning, and it said that she had just spoken to the doctor and uh, he is stable. He, he has not um, declined anymore, but he is certainly not out of the woods and um, lots of optimism. But we're going to pray. All right, let's pray for Jody and for others this morning. Let's pray. Father, we know you to be the God who can provide um, when medical professionals are unable to. And I, I have tremendous confidence, tremendous confidence in um, the medical professionals in our society men and women who have trained and men and women who are highly qualified and skilled and educated and experienced.
But every doctor I know would say they are powerless to change the situation a person um, finds himself or herself in. They treat the patient. Only you can provide the recovery. Only you can provide the deliverance. Only you can bring the healing into the body of a person who is sick. And I know through the Christmas week, um, Trisha had been virtually alone there at the hospital in North Carolina. Um, Jody highly sedated in order to um, be treated with the ventilator. This is not what they anticipated as one year closes. They've had a difficult, difficult year or two. And Lord, they are faithful servants of yours. I've known Jody and Tricia to be kingdom-minded and purposed in their engagement in ministry that changes the world. Lord, I pray that you would meet their needs in a way that leaves doctors and nurses and other trained professionals with no explanation other than the living God showed up and provided for his need. I pray that you would wrap your arms around Trisha right now, there in a waiting room or whether she is in the room with Jody. I pray that she would sense your presence in a profound way, that she would know you are with her and that you are providing for her and her husband. And Lord, I pray that you would bring him through this crisis, you would deliver him from his health crisis, and you would allow them soon to be back serving you on the mission field where they have served faithfully for so many years. I know there are many, many who are praying for them, and we simply join our hearts and minds with theirs, asking you to meet their needs. And Lord, we lift up the others that I've mentioned. Of course, we pray for Jean and Brenda and Brian and Katie. Lord, we pray that you would um, bring healing to Jean's body, that you would protect the rest of his family from illness. Lord, we pray for the leaders of our church family, some kind of on the end of the of the treatment cycle, some just beginning to think that they might have to, um, to receive treatment. Lord, each and every one of them, we pray that you would intervene, that you would work in a profound way, that you would help them to recover and recover fully and quickly. Again, Lord, in a way that would leave all people saying, the living God intervened. We thank you for the privilege of praying for the people we love and the people we um, serve alongside. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of your family, your body. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Earlier this week, I um, planned on looking, and, and we're still going to, but I planned on looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And uh, the phrase that was on my mind is, out with the old, in with the new. Because that's really where I am. I am ready for the old to be gone and the new to be here. That phrase has never been more appropriate than now that the old would go and the new would come. It, it suggests, that phrase, it suggests that in order to move forward, we have to purge from our experience, purge from our lives. We have to let go of one thing, you know, let go of one and grab a hold of something else. Out with the old, in with the new. Uh, letting go of 2020 isn't very hard to do. I, I'm ready for this year to be behind us. And I'm kind of looking forward to 2021, but I do so with some apprehension. Because this week I am saying good riddance to 2020. I really am. I'm ready to be past all of this. And I'm ready to leap into 2021. The problem is I hope it's not like the people of Israel as they were anticipating the day of the Lord. Because they saw the day of the Lord as being this, just this tremendous day of personal victory. And Amos wrote to them, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. And this is the imagery that I, I really hope is not ours as we look into 2021. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. You know, when I look into 2021, I, I, I really hope we're letting go of all the stuff that has made 2020 such a challenge. And my hope is 2021, very quickly, will be a year of deliverance and a year of renewal and a year of great optimism. 
I've been reflecting upon my own journey over this uh, week, just spending time in prayerful reflection, asking the question, if I were to pass away right now, if I were to die before 2021 arrives, what am I going to be remembered for? Well, I want to kind of apply that to our church, too, because, you know, we have no promise of what the future holds. We have no promise that with January 1st, you know, everything's going to be okay, everything's going to turn around and be so much better. And so let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, with the reminder that we do, we, you and I, we determine our legacy. We determine what the year is going to be like. Because our attitudes and actions now create how we will be remembered or how we will be perceived then. First Thessalonians, let me say it again. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. It's Paul, Silas, and Timothy writing this letter. It's really Paul writing the letter. But he is accompanied by Silas and he's accompanied by Timothy. Paul includes them in the letter that he writes to the believers of a city called Thessalonica. And he writes to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. All right, verses 2 and 3. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, I stop there in, in terms of the text for the message, but I want to read verses 4 and 5 as well. Listen, for we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Paul says, we know that the living God has chosen you, you people of Thessalonica. And here's why. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, our gospel came to you also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. All right, these words like Thessalonica, that, you know, you know First Thessalonians, you know Second Thessalonians, but the idea of Thessalonica, you may say, I'm not really familiar with that. Well, Paul had birthed a church. Paul had planted a congregation. He had led people to Jesus in that city called Thessalonica. He had discipled them. He had gathered them together. He had started them on the pathway of becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. And that city was not a pleasant place for Paul to do ministry within. Uh, it would be very fair for him to look back at his experiences in Thessalonica and say, whew, I am so glad to be past that. I'm so glad to be done with that. I'm so glad to have uh, moved on to other things. We see the story in uh, Acts chapter 17. Uh, Acts is a narrative book. It's, a, it's an ongoing story. Uh, Luke wrote the book of Acts. And really, Acts is the second volume of his story of God's engagement with people. The gospel of Luke is the first volume. It's the story of God's engagement with people from Jesus' birth to his ascension to the right hand of the Father. And then Luke picks up right where he left off at the end of the Gospel of Luke as he writes the book of Acts. And he is writing about God's engagement, his involvement with his people from Jesus' ascension to the right hand of the Father to Paul's imprisonment in Rome. And that's obviously not the end of the story of God's involvement with his church. But that's when Paul finished the letter. I'm sorry, that's when Luke finished uh, the, the, the book called Acts. When Luke finished it, Paul was in prison in Rome. And in Acts chapter 17, we see the story of Paul in Thessalonica. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. And the church was birthed. People believed. In fact, the Scripture says some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. 
Luke is explaining to us, he's detailing for us that the work that God was doing there in Thessalonica began with Paul's preaching and the church or people responded, the church was birthed and um, everything was rolling along pretty good. But it didn't take very long at all for opposition to arise. Opposition organized very quickly. The very next verse, verse 5, but other Jews, now remember, a significant number of women and Jews and Greeks all responded to the gospel. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. Now, now what do you expect is going to happen to them if they're brought out to the crowd? You know, they're going to be put to death. They're going to be beaten and abused by the people. But they don't, they don't find them there. They don't find them in Jason's house. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials, shouting, these men have caused trouble all over the world, and they have now come here. And Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil, and they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. I mean, it didn't take any time at all for opposition to the gospel to arise within that community that we would call Thessalonica. Do you know that the church shines brightest where, there, where the situation seems darkest? Do you know that the church does its very best? The church is the most vibrant. The church is the most... Um, impactful, where the opposition is the greatest. For decades, all of my life as a follower of Christ, China has been the nation where the church has grown the fastest, where opposition was the greatest, where persecution was the most fierce, where um, becoming a believer and gathering in worship was illegal. And we've all heard the stories of the house church of China where believers were forced to come together, not in buildings like we enjoy, but in someone's home. And when they sang songs, they, they would sing it not at the top of their lungs, they would whisper it. They would sing in stifled voices for fear that neighbors would hear them worshiping Jesus within the home and would turn them over to the authorities, just like we saw in Acts chapter 17. For decades, the church has done best in China where living for Jesus is the hardest. But that has changed in recent days. China, though the church continues to explode in mainland China, China is not the number one nation in terms of rapid growth for Jesus. The number one nation in the world today, Iran, where being a believer is illegal, where leading a person to faith in Jesus can bring a death penalty. In Iran... Um, scores of people, a staggering number of people are leaving Islam for Christianity. Let me say it again. Where persecution is the fiercest, where opposition is the, is the strongest, that's where the church seems to be doing the best. These people in Iran are turning to Jesus right in the face of the government and cultural opposition with the risk of death the loss of family, the loss of jobs, the loss of their homes, and yet they are turning to Jesus in great numbers. We need to understand within the Western church that anyone committed to honor and glorify Christ will encounter opposition. It is good for us. And we need to remember the open hostility, the open opposition that Paul and others encountered as they served Jesus in that first century church. The next time you feel tempted to say that you and I are facing persecution within our culture, the next time someone says, well, you know, they took prayer out of the schools, that was the end of the church, okay? The next time someone gets angry because a courthouse removes the Ten Commandments from the wall, okay, the next time that angers you, Remember what real persecution looks like. Remember that there are brothers and sisters around the world who are losing their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. And we should also remember how the Apostle Paul and the others of that first century church responded to the opposition that they faced. 
and how they remained dedicated in their labor for Jesus Christ. We would do well to remember these Thessalonians in how they responded. Did you catch the way Paul described them? We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we do best in the midst of opposition. We really do. I know we like to think that we want to live in a country, for instance, where there is no opposition to our faith, that, that we're able to just kind of move forward without anyone pushing back against what we preach. We like to think that the ideal society would be a place where we are fully welcomed and fully affirmed, and we as the voice of Jesus would not receive any opposition whatsoever. But that's not the environment of a um, society impacting church. Okay, that's not the society. That's not the environment for a, a church that's going to change the world. In the northeastern United States, one of the largest commodities, one of the most valuable commodities is codfish. Cod, okay? Big business up in the northeast. And there's such an appetite for cod all through the northeast, but really all across the country as well, but very much so in the northeastern states. There is such an appetite for it, such a public demand, that shippers have to get the cod from you know, where they're caught in the boats to the market where people can purchase them. But there's a problem there. Because if they catch the fish, clean the fish, freeze the fish to ship the fish, well, the cod loses its taste. It doesn't taste like fresh cod, and so it's not as marketable. Shippers decided when they realized that shipping it frozen wasn't going to work, they decided to ship it in salt water. Keep them alive, but ship them in salt water. But the problem only got worse. Not only did they lose their flavor, but the meat of the fish lost its texture. The meat becomes mushy. It becomes kind of soft, impalatable. Is that the right word, unpalatable? It doesn't taste good uh, as people were to eat it. And so the shippers discovered the best way to market their cod is to ship them alive along with a natural enemy. They have these big tanks where they ship the fish, and inside the tanks they put not only the cod, but they put catfish in the tanks because catfish are the cod's natural enemy. And the whole time that tank is heading down the highway, those catfish are zipping around that tank trying to catch a cod. And the cod know that, and they are zipping around the tank trying to avoid capture by the codfish. And what ended up happening is the shippers discovered that when the cod arrived at the marketplace, it was just as fresh, just as tasty, just as wonderful as when it was first caught in the boat. What's true about codfish is also true about the church. We are actually our best when we face opposition. We are actually the best in terms of impacting the culture when the culture is in opposition to us. We should rejoice when the culture pushes against us. We should celebrate the fact that the culture doesn't embrace us. We shouldn't look to be a part of the culture. We should understand that the, the message we preach is directly opposed to the message of the culture. You see, we, we swim, or we should be, swimming against the flow of the culture, not with the flow of the culture. We should be, because of the stand we take for Christ, because of the positions we hold, inspired by our faith in Christ, we should flow against the, the or we should swim against the flow of the culture around us. Again, opposition is, is really good for our faith. Opposition is actually an inevitable part of the journey. If you don't believe me, maybe you'll believe Jesus. Jesus said, if the world hates you, and we might change that word if to when, okay? When the world hates you. Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, or we could change that word, when they persecuted me, remember they will persecute you also. 
if they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. We shouldn't be surprised that the world stands in opposition to what we preach. In Paul's very last letter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he writes about end times persecution. He writes, mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of good, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Now, either we're there, either within our culture the opposition is so intense against the true message of Jesus that that's a description of where we are, or that's a description of where we will one day be culturally. Not the church, but the culture within which we serve Jesus. That the opposition is going to be intense. The opposition is going to be fierce. The opposition is going to be purposed in stifling our voice, in limiting our impactfulness. Paul, in verse 10, offers you, Timothy, you, however, you know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, mark this down. Tuck this away in your mind and heart. Recognize that this is the truth of God's Word, not just some possibility. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We have to ask ourselves, why don't we face intense persecution within our culture? Why don't we face the opposition that believers in other parts of the world face? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's because we really don't take a radical stand against the flow of the culture. Maybe it's because we really aren't that different from the world around us. Maybe who we are is really just the stuff of words. You know, I prayed a prayer sometime in the past. I gave my heart to Jesus. And when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But it doesn't really shape the way I live. It doesn't shape the convictions I hold. It doesn't guide the decisions I make. Jesus is my Savior, but he's not my Lord. That might be the problem on why we don't face persecution. See, the question for us is not how to avoid persecution. The question for us is how must we respond when the inevitable persecution comes? The opposition, the oppression, the pushback to the message we hold to be true. Now, we can't control the opposition. I can't control how people respond to the message of Jesus, but I can control how I respond to those who respond negatively to the things of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 4, Paul wrote, To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty, we are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. This is the part I want us to hear. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I mean, Paul, that's not a very good recruitment slogan, you know, for drawing people within to this church that you're preaching. See, we, we kind of embrace the idea of Napoleon, um, what was that movie, Napoleon Dynamite? Napoleon Dynamite, where, um, where um, Pab no. Pablo, who ran? Pedro. I should have watched this yesterday in order to get my sermon illustration all up to point, but I knew that there'd be some folks who could really identify with Napoleon Dynamite, when he was helping Pedro, you know, run for... Um, president of the school, of the you know, student council, or whatever it is. Um, 
Napoleon Dynamite, the, the phrase is, um, you know, your best dreams are going to come true. He's going to give you your wildest dreams. All of your wildest dreams will come true with paid bills. Well, see, that's kind of how we preach Jesus. All of your wildest dreams are going to come true. It's going to be your best life now. You're not going to have any more problems or any more challenges or any more trials or any more difficulties. And nothing could be farther from the truth. See, the truth is, if we are committed to Christ, if we're walking with Christ, if we're standing firmly upon the words of Christ, we are going to encounter opposition because the life we're living creates creates this tension within the world around us. We're telling people that prosperity and security and safety and, and all these sorts of things, that, that's not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is to empty yourself so that he can fill you. The way of Jesus is to be weak within the world so that he can be strong through you. The things of Jesus are absolutely opposite to the things of the culture. The church of Thessalonica is a fabulous example for us to imitate. Now, just so that you understand, this is not just pie-in-the-sky talk from Paul. When he writes his second letter to the Thessalonians, he begins in the very same fashion. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecution and trial you are enduring. The pushback against the Thessalonians didn't end when Paul left the community. When Paul fled for personal safety, the persecution against the church didn't come to an end. They continued to push back against the message of the Thessalonians and their love, their faith, their endurance all continued to increase. They all grew. You know, Paul pointed to the Thessalonian believers and said, this is how to effectively live your faith. He says that in 2 Thessalonians 1, we boast about you to all the other churches. We tell the other churches, if you want to know what it looks like to live lives of dynamic witness, to live lives of world-changing impact, just look at those Thessalonians, the way they live their lives. Look at the way they embrace the faith, the way they serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Their work was birthed in the faith they placed in Christ. Their labor was cultivated in the love they had for Christ and for their neighbors. And their perseverance was inspired by their hope in the faithfulness of Jesus. I've been reflecting just on what reputation I've earned over the last 12 months. I mean, I haven't been at my best. I I can tell you that straight up. This this has been a a challenging year. It's been a difficult year. And and looking back over the last several months, I haven't been at my best. I can't say that I represented Jesus as well as I could have through these challenging months. As I say good riddance to 2020, I also have to ask myself, what reputation will I earn in the coming year? How will my service for Jesus impact the people around me. So let's talk about this renewed commitment in 2021. And let me read the passage again. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 3. And just kind of imagine if Paul were writing about us, would he write these words? We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before God our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 2020 has been a year of confusion and frustration and challenge and deep disappointment. When I look at our society, and I'm not an old man. I'm older than many of you. I got a lot of years left, I hope. But when I look over my life, I don't remember a time that our culture was more divided than it is now. I don't remember a time where there was such open hostility and animosity between people. And I've never known a time in the church when we've been more distracted from our call in Christ to take the gospel to all people. You know, we have a mandate from Jesus. We have a commission from the Lord Jesus. 
to take the gospel into all the world, to make disciples of all people everywhere, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus taught us. That's our mandate. That's what we're held accountable for. That's what Jesus um, instructed us to do as his body of believers. Now, 2021 is yet unwritten. I have no idea what the coming months hold. We're not going to be out of the challenges, the difficulties, the, the painful circumstances we find ourselves in. We're not going to be out of that anytime soon. It's not going to go away January 1st. You know when the ball drops in New York City, if, if they do the ball this year, if that ball drops and hits the bottom, it's not going to send out this reverberation and all the COVID-19 stuff is just eradicated from our culture. It's not going to happen. Experts say the only real surprise is that we experience this spike that we've witnessed prior to the end of the year as opposed to after the end of the year. Experts were saying they anticipated the spike to come after December 31st. That's the surprise, is that we're experiencing it now rather than then. But know this, 2021 does not control how we're going to respond. The 12 months on your calendar does not determine how we will respond to the challenges we find ourselves in. As the new year dawns, I want you to know um, our shared future, a future I believe is full of promise and potential. Um, I, I believe it's going to be ours to experience. I have a renewed optimism about what God is going to do through the people called Allsbury Baptist Church of Burleson, Texas. I believe with everything that I am that 2021 has the potential to be our greatest year ever in ministry. Next Sunday morning, which is January 3rd, we're going to begin a six-week teaching series on how we are writing that legacy. You know, I, I officiate funerals with great regularity. Over my um, 30 years of ministry, I've officiated a lot of funerals. Best, best funeral services that I'm a part of are ones where the family stands up and speaks words of testimony about the deceased where a family member stands up and talks about the impact that person had upon his or her life, that that person's life made a difference. I remember I did one particular funeral. It was for a man who died of liver disease. It was, it was cirrhosis of the liver. Uh, alcoholism took his life prematurely. Uh, one of the boys stood up, and this was his testimony to his father's legacy. I will never forget it. He stood up, he said, my father loved to party, and he was really good at it. And he meant that as an affirmation. He meant that as a proper legacy for his father. I wanted to stand up and say, no, your father killed himself with a bottle. That's not a thing to celebrate. That's a thing to grieve over. We are writing our legacy. People will remember in generations to come who we are as the people of Allsbury Baptist. When our church was planted 25 years ago, we were meeting in the elementary school. And we began to build a, a new building, which is now our youth building and our preschool building over there, children's building. Um, before that building was built, um, all of these neighborhoods around us, they didn't exist. Okay? When, when we began Allsbury in the elementary school, none of these houses across the street were built. Burleson ended um, at the street just the other side, Douglas, the street just the other side of the elementary school. There was none of these houses. And then the houses started popping up. You know, developers started building homes and um, preparing it for new families. And you know what happens, right, when a builder builds a house? They have to, by city ordinance, they have to put a tree in the front yard. Well, they don't put a big old tree in the front yard. They put this little stick you know, it's just a little skinny stick in the ground, you know, and it's tied down to a couple of stakes. I remember looking at the houses across there and, and thinking to myself, you know, when that day comes that it's the second or third or fourth family living in those homes, and those trees are not just little sticks, but they're great big old red oaks, you know, providing shade to children playing in the, in the yard, and families are enjoying the community. I, I kept thinking, Allsbury is going to still be there impacting the neighborhoods, impacting the families, making a difference in the lives of people who have found Burleson to be their home. 
We make the decision. It's not something outside of ourselves. We make the, the decision of how we're going to live in this coming year for Jesus. And again, as the new year dawns, it, it's one full of promise. Beginning next Sunday morning, we're going to begin the six-week teaching series on how we write our legacy, how we become the church that others look to and say, now that's how it's done. See, that's what's in my heart, and that's what's in my mind today, that the day will come in the not-too-distant future when other people will say, if you want to know what it means to live a life that honors Jesus, just look at those people called Allsbury. If you want to know what it is to be a church that is impacting the world for Jesus, just look at that family that calls itself Allsbury. Look at how they're doing it and imitate them. Follow their example. Let them be your guide. So as I read the passage, I've got a few questions. Where are we going to place our faith? Faith that sparks a determined and dedicated service to Christ. And what's going to inspire our labor in the coming months? As we labor for the cause of Christ, what motivates us? What drives us to serve Christ deeply? I don't know if you noticed, but in the text, he said, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love. Our English-speaking ears, we hear work and labor, and we think, well, that's synonymous. But the Greek is not synonymous. See, the work is, it means a word that it's just a natural thing to do. Some of you love to work in the garden. Some of you love to work in the flower beds and get things pretty. And For you, it's just something you get up in the morning, you, you can't wait to get outside and start digging in the dirt. That's the work, you know, that just comes naturally. For some of us, that is intense labor, okay? I, I love flowers in the flower beds. I can't stand the work that it takes to have lovely flowers in the flower bed. And that's the difference between work and labor, because Work is what just comes natural. The Greek word for labor is what takes effort, what takes a commitment of mind, what takes a determination from within that moves beyond. But then there was the third element. He said your endurance inspired by hope, that you stick with the task because you have this hope in what Jesus is going to do in the future. How will that describe us as the people of God? What reputation are we, the people called Allsbury, earning through fruitful ministry? I read a great story this week. No fewer than 307 people have lost their lives attempting to climb Mount Everest. 307 people lost their lives in the attempt to climb Mount Everest. Everest is the highest mountain in the world. It rests in the Himalayas, which which sit on the border between Nepal and Tibet. In June of 1924, George Mallory and Andrew Irvine, they were British mountaineers, they were attempting to climb to the summit of Mount Everest. And as they did, um, they were followed by the rest of the team. The team was back behind them on the trail heading up to the summit. As they ascended the mountain, they disappeared into the fog, into the clouds at the top of the mountain. The ones who followed them saw them make their way up, but then they just kind of disappeared into the clouds. Those other climbers expected to find Mallory and Irvine at the top, but when they arrived, there was no sign of them. They weren't there. They didn't know what happened to them. It would be over seven decades before the body of George Mallory would be found, frozen in the ice of Mount Everest. The body of Andrew Irvine has never been located all these years later. As the search for the two climbers began, as people tried to figure out what happened to them when they weren't at the top of the mountain, there was a report from those who followed, and it simply stated, when last seen, they were still climbing. When last seen, they were still climbing. I wonder what people will say about us. When last seen, they were still working hard to build the kingdom of God. When last seen, they were united as one in their work, in their labor, in their love. When last seen, they were loving their neighbors as they loved themselves. When last seen, they were growing in their faith and discipling others in their faith. When last seen, they were taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. 
When last seen, they were changing the power, changing the world in the power and love of Jesus Christ. When last seen, they were faithfully fulfilling the call of God placed upon their life. Out with the old and in with the new. 2020, I bid you good riddance. And I look to 2021 with incredible optimism of what God is going to do through us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. When we are unfaithful, you remain faithful. When we fail to honor our promises, you are faithful to fulfill every promise you've ever uttered. When we drop the ball in loving one another, you continue to love us in spite of anything we may have done or said or believed. When we are less than perfect, you remain perfect. Uh, this year, Lord, you know. You know how difficult it's been. You know how challenging it's been. You know how painful different aspects of this year have been. But none of those circumstances change who you are or change what you have in store for us. None of those circumstances determine the lives we're going to live. Or it may, it may hinder how we function in the community. It may change the way we interact with other people, but it doesn't change our call. We are called to make disciples of all people everywhere, beginning right here at home, across the street, and then continuing until we're reaching people across the world. Lord, I pray that we as a church family, beginning this very day, will um, devote ourselves to identifying what it looks like to build a legacy that lasts the generations, and that we would be like the Thessalonians, committed to serve you with all that we are, regardless of what the society may be doing around us. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the people who call Allsbury home. I thank you, Lord, that um, there is enough potential within this simple body of believers to reach the world with the gospel if we follow after you fully. May we enter 2021 with just that as our commitment, to follow you fully. And it's in your name we pray, amen.